Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Cartel. A very, very warm welcome to you all. Thanks for joining the Better Public Media David Beetson Memorial Lecture for 2022. Um, I'd like to extend a, an extremely warm welcome to the Minister for Broadcasting and Media, Honourable Chris Farfoy. He's going to be giving the, uh, the David Beetson Memorial Lecture. Um, the Minister will have uh, roughly 20 minutes and then some minutes for Q&A afterwards. And after that, we'll be moving to a panel discussion and a very warm welcome to all our panelists, including Melissa Lee, the uh, uh, national spokesperson for broadcasting media, uh, Honorable Tracy Martin, of course, former New Zealand First MP, uh, Dr. Gavin Ellis, uh, former editor in chief at the New Zealand Herald, and uh, my own colleague from Victoria University of Wellington, Teherenga Waka, uh, Dr. Trisha Dunleavy. So there'll be plenty of interesting discussion throughout the evening. Um, without further ado, I think we'll move straight into the Minister's speech. So thank you very, very much indeed for joining us tonight, Minister. We understand you're an exceptionally busy man. And I have to say that Better Public Media was extremely pleased to see the recent uh, announcements about the funding for the new public media entity. Now, it's interesting here that the... Uh, the, the, the results of our, of our mini survey suggest that a good two thirds uh, yeah. of, of people are in support of the new public media entity. Perhaps 29% uh, would like more information and one in, one in 20 aren't so sure uh, uh, and are saying no. So you, you now have the chance to radically change the poll. Um, so Minister Farfoy was of course the uh, Minister of Broadcasting Me and Media in addition to being the Minister for Justice and Immigration. And he's also been acting Minister for Emergency Management. Hopefully this won't be a terrible emergency. Um, he was also Labour MP for MANA from between 2010 and 2020. And he has over a decade working as a journalist at both TVNZ and the BBC. So a very, very warm welcome to you, Chris, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Peter. Can I acknowledge everyone uh, tonight? Kia ora tato katoa. Um, can I acknowledge uh, Miles and the members of the Better Public Media and um, to my parliamentary colleague, Melissa Lee. Um, can I also acknowledge uh, both the Honourable Tracy Martin and Tricia Dunleavy, uh, who are also um, on our Business Case Governance Group for the Strengthening Public Media uh, work, um, which obviously you've mentioned uh, their relation to the budget, uh, Peter. So thank you um, for the invitation to be here tonight. and. And for the privilege of giving um, uh, the address uh, in memory of David, um, I'm, I kind of worked with David a little bit back in 2014 uh, as opposition spokesperson for broadcasting. Um, very uh, useful to draw on his wisdom and knowledge. So can I acknowledge the fact that uh, Better Public Media uh, acknowledges his contribution to not just journalism, but also um, to broadcasting policy um, uh, with the address as part of your annual general meeting. Um, there are a couple of the fiction exists um, for the same reason that David, um, the journalist and presenter, became an advocate uh, for public media um, because. Uh, it is so critically important uh, to the future of our democracy and culture. Um, the new entity uh, and strengthening public media uh, will ensure people can continue to see and hear quality local content and access trusted news. There is a lot uh, about our current public media that is excellent uh, and for us all to be proud of. I'm not going to go into uh, what I believe uh, is uh, good and bad, uh, but there are some great shows on TVNZ and RNZ they both have good, strong, independent journalism, uh, and they are both trying to modernise and take on the digital challenge, and they have professional and dedicated staff. Uh, what is also clear is that New Zealand's public media, like that in every other democracy, is under pressure, and some large parts of our community simply don't engage uh, with our entities at all. Uh, and we need to give our public media the chance to grow uh, and also to evolve. And that's why in February, Cabinet did make the decision to create a new, independent, future-focused public media entity, one that will be multi-platform and so be better able to serve 
and meet uh, the needs of all of New Zealand's audiences. I'm sure you've already poured over, as Peter mentioned, um, the budget uh, details and also details since the announcement. So the basic shape of the new entity, um, you might already know, and work has been done, obviously, uh, about what it is going to be asked to do. We also know the ongoing challenges and competition uh, that it's going to face. And so what I'm excited about are the benefits and what the future might look like. Um, for a start, our public media is going to be better shaped to deal with the future, no matter what it brings. It will bring together expertise in two existing platforms, but have far greater flexibility backed by uh, up-to-date and modern legislation to respond to change and be focused on new ways of delivery to reach local audiences. It will provide a new home for New Zealand content, hopefully making our local music, um, the likes of comedy, news and drama more accessible and be better able to compete for the attention of our audiences by providing, providing content where they want to get it. I have been uh, very clear about the expectation that the government has set that the entity will continue to provide what existing audiences value and all current non-commercial programming and services, so the likes of Radio New Zealand National and Concert FM will continue in their current guise. But critically, it will also better reach those groups who aren't currently well served, so our public media system will be fairer, our culture better reflected, and all New Zealanders being represented. It's not enough uh, that the people of our generation and older support and use our public media. Uh, the new entity has to be at home in the online space because this is where younger people are. And as New Zealand only as audience research has shown, also some large, large ethnic groups, the likes of Māori, Pacific and Asian New Zealanders. A key feature of the entity also has to be strong, independent news services offering content across different platforms. The journalist in me is excited about the opportunity we have to build on the strength of the current newsrooms and share more news and current affairs. Our democracy, uh, as I mentioned earlier, will be better supported through people being able to find trusted and truthful news and information and being better informed. And that is becoming a greater challenge day by day. But it's the father in me that's more excited. Uh, we are preparing public media for future audiences to celebrate our unique identity, um, to laugh, to create and to question in a New Zealand way. And only we can do that. Also, our public media will be more sustainable and be better able to be seen and compete and work with dominant international platforms. We will be investing in technology and infrastructure once and making it available for the benefit of our wider sector. So through the initial cabinet decision-making process, we made two important decisions around the entity's financial and funding model. First, the entity is not for profit. And as I mentioned earlier, we will guarantee continuation of non-commercial programming and that it will have a mixed funding model. The ability to generate commercial revenue to supplement Crown funding will make it more financially sustainable and allow it to better deliver on its public media outcomes. And this includes providing local news, entertainment and documentaries across a number of platforms and partnering with other New Zealand media. The ability to raise advertising and other revenue is particularly important when the cost of producing content continues to increase as we've seen recently. And we want to get the most out of the government investment and not undermine what has been a successful commercial enterprise in TVNZ. Uh, in this new public media world and model, I'm sure we all agree that we must maximise public media outcomes and build on the successes of the current such structure. The second major decision Cabinet made around funding was the in principle decision that the government would fund half of the entity's estimated annual operating budget so $200 million in Crown funding annually. I'm sure, as Peter has mentioned, you would have seen last week's budget announcement that from July, uh, when the entity will begin operating through to 2526, government will be providing new funding of $109 million a year, so $327 million over three years. The increase in Crown funding for public media of $109 million a year is to provide the entity an assured operating baseline into the future, and to meet public media outcomes. New Zealand has historically underinvested in public media, and I'm pleased that this is being rebalanced. Uh, your group, Better Public Media, has suggested uh, that a type of public media levy could be better funding, could be a better funding mechanism. 
I think the details of setting a levy, so who pays one, how much it should be for various individuals and groups and how it should be paid are problematic, as we're seeing in debates in other countries. And those debates and our history shows that a levy provides no guarantee around government funding. So my position is quite straightforward. Public media is the public good, so any government contribution, contribution should be publicly funded. The best thing that we can do for public media is to set it up effectively, fund it, and have it show its value. Then the public, supported by people like you, can ensure it continues to be well supported by future governments. I would also add that for the entity to perform well, it has to be built and set up the right way. And the budget also has a separate amount of just over $40 million over four years for change and establishment costs. Uh, that work is now underway because we are in the estab establishment phase uh, for the strong public media program. We know uh, that we want this entity, we know what we want this entity to achieve and a legislated charter will set out the entity's purpose and objectives, but the task of creating a new entity is starting. Uh, the Establishment Board, which um, is chaired by the Honourable Tracy Martin, who's uh, both um, on this call and is on your next session, uh, will oversee the detailed design of the entity and the change process. Uh, the Establishment Board has three main areas of responsibility. First, it will look at operational matters such as entity structure and organisational strategy, and it will provide advice on these for the incoming entity board to consider. It will also oversee the development and implementation of a change management plan to enable, in conjunction with the existing entities, a smooth transition for TVNZ and RNZ operations, and importantly, staff into the new entity. The board will also give me advice on the entity's financial model, the monitoring framework, and any other issues relating to the entity's legal or financial framework or accountability arrangements. This work uh, will run in parallel with the legislative process. I'm hoping to have a bill in the House around the middle of this year, that's not far away, and the public will have the chance to give their views, including on the Charter through the Select Committee stage. Um, I think um, that's probably an appropriate note to which to start wrap things up, um, but every democratic country is facing the same issues around public media and trying to find ways to make their media sustainable uh, and relevant in a digital age. What we're trying to do is get ahead of any crisis and creating an organisation to work in this new world, one that adapts with New Zealanders as they continue to, to change the ways in which they watch, they listen and engage with their news and entertainment. RNZ and TVNZ were set up for a different world around the focus of traditional radio and television. And within the constraints of the existing legislation, they've done what they can do to change, to modernise and meet significant challenges. We know they are both trusted and valued. And this makes me optimistic about what we can achieve for public media when we have an entity with modern, enabling legislation, a consistent focus, flexibility, and with principles, structure and funding to nurture content and feed audiences. Um, I hope that David uh, would be supportive of that. Uh, so thank you for the chance to honour him tonight. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, Peter. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much indeed, Minister. Uh, if anybody does have questions, um, in order for that we avoid a cacophony of, uh, of feedback on, on, on Zoom, uh, please can you put your questions in the chat function? If you haven't used Zoom before, that's roughly in the middle of the screen at the bottom. Um, I, I, I might kick things off um, I think one, one of the issues we've been debating, um, well, partly since the, the announcement of the, of the new media entity, but also particularly since the announcement of the budget, um, is the question of, of the long-term viability of this um, past, past the next election. Um, of course, uh, you, you, you will have plans if, if you're, you're the elected government, but eventually, inevitably, another government will come into power. Uh, and there is a risk there that, as has happened before, um, a new government may have different priorities and simply say, well, we don't like that. We're going to, we're going to rip, rip up the funding mechanism or we're going to change the structure. And then we're, we're back to you know, relying on the market to provide our, our, our public media services. So are there any measures that the government has considered uh, that would help ensure the longevity and sustainability of, of this new entity and indeed the funding level? 
Well, I think uh, to answer the, the last aspect of your question, um, Peter, I think we should take from the fact that we've uh, agreed to in, uh, to have $109 million of new funding for, for public media is um, a show of commitment um, post the policy work from the government to address some of the long-term systemic issues that have been uh, uh, not just with public media, but the, the, the long-term survival of our wider um, public um, uh, wider media environment uh, as well. Uh, I, I think making sure that we do have the continued uh, values of public media enshrined in legislation, which will be there um, in the House soon, is also important. I think it's the absolute bedrock of the people who are uh, part of your organisation, and they will can guarantee uh, a continuation of that. Um, I'm going to be try to be diplomatic uh, in what I say, um, because you've got a, a panel coming up. Um, but I would say is that we've put, put commitment um, into the policy work. Um, we have spoken to not just those who are um, advocates for public media, but also the wider media environment, given the challenges that uh, wider media environment have had over the last uh, 24 months. Um, it was looking pretty dire at one stage uh, and tried to ensure that we strengthen our public media system. Uh, we maintain the values there. Um, Last year's day, we backed that up with um, a considerable amount of injection and funding. That is post the $50 million that we used to support media during the COVID crisis and the Public Interest Journalism Fund, um, because we fundamentally understand the importance um, of not just the fourth estate, but uh, local content and a strong public media environment and a wider media environment of the plurality needed and to make sure that we have a continued strong media environment not just for the people who are on this call tonight, um, but their children and grandchildren. I think we all grew up having the, that, that ability to access it. There's um, challenges and opportunities uh, in the way that media content is um, delivered these days. And we've got to make sure that we continue the commitment there. Thank you very much indeed for that fulsome response, Chris. Um, I think we have uh, other messages and questions coming in on the chat. Uh, Miles, are you going to uh, to field these? Uh, well, there's not as many as we were expecting, uh, Peter, so I think it's fine. You can read them out. That's fine. Okay. Well, well uh, our, uh, actually, one of our panellists, Gavin Ellis, has asked, given that the timetable has already been announced, what will be the period? What will be the period available for the public input uh, to the committee stage of the bill? Thanks, Gavin. Um, we're on a bit of a time frame here. The legislation has to be well and uh, in, uh, uh, passed before um, the new entity uh, arrives on July the thirty first of next year. Uh, we won't truncate it as um, as is the, the term around here, at Parliament. So we'll make sure that the public have a good amount of time to be able to give it the scrutiny and give input into the likes of the legislation and the charter as well, Gavin. So uh, I know that. Um, uh, we're up against it in terms of time, um, but you won't see it truncated to a point where I think there'd be a public outcry on the amount of time that's there. And we, we have a question also from Steve Little, who has actually just joined the Better Public Media Board. Um, so welcome, Steve, uh, who's asking, is there a case for a model like citizen credits where everyone can, that everyone can use to access accredited media? Uh, and is there a way in which the uh, the present special interest media for investigative work could be mainstreamed or made part of a permanent budget. I haven't really considered that. That sounds like something that New Zealand on air, if, I'm, if, if I think I can read or understand the question properly from Steve there, Peter. Um, uh, I, I don't I don't have a significant answer for that because it sounds like it's something that um, New Zealand on air would consider as opposed to something that. Um, uh, a new public media might, entity might. Okay, thank you. And then Sally Wenley has a question. Uh, what do you have to say to commercial media who may be concerned this could lead them uh, to be unable to compete financially or, or form a potential monopoly? Yeah, look, we've obviously had um, questions like that since we formally announced this back in March. I think Michael Boggs from NZ to Me has been um, uh, quite open and has concerned about that. I think one of the things that we've tried to make sure is uh, central to the public new, new public media entity, as well as serving the needs of public media. And um, they also have to be mindful of the wider media environment and work with other media environments to make uh, other media entities uh, collaborate or cooperate when possible. 
there are some very simple ways to do that. I think for a small country, um, a lot of our entities are investing in infrastructure uh, multiple times that uh, I think some people uh, in this group would prefer that either the public media entity or the commercial media entities themselves would be able to invest in either content production or, or people in seats. Um, so that is one of the simple ways that we have asked the new entity to make sure that when it is operating, um, it doesn't take a, a, a dominant approach. It's um, very much a public media focused entity, um, but also mindful of how it can ensure that the wider media market um, is healthy as well. Okay. Uh, David Cormack has a question uh, saying, given the likely similarities of the public media entities charter, and New Zealand Air's role under the Broadcasting Act and the likelihood of serving the same audiences, how will the two coexist? Uh, and will New Zealand Air's funding be significantly impacted from financial year 2023 onwards? Well, I think they can absolutely coexist. One of the messages that I have um, made sure I've uh, given to people interested and to New Zealand On Air itself is that the New Zealand On Air model for over 30 years has worked extremely well. Um, and I think making sure it is still there, um, continuing to either fund uh, requests from um, possibly um, the, P, uh, the public media entity or the wider media market, it's good to have that um, competitive tension in the system. Um, I'm not going to uh, talk about uh, what we might decide in the next budget, um, but I think that New Zealand On Air continues to have a strong future in making sure that all types of uh, New Zealand content, whether it be news and current affairs or music or drama continues. Um, I think um, yeah, within the legislation uh, and within the cabinet paper, if people have read it, uh, is making sure that those two entities, the new entity and uh, New Zealand On Air, have to work collectively to make sure that we maximise our, our public media outputs. Okay. Um, a a follow-on question on New Zealand there from Karen McKenzie. Um, is New Zealand Air funding still going to be available for TVNZ programmes? And if not, how much of an increase is this new fund providing for television programmes compared with uh, what New Zealand Air funding was already able to provide? So those kinds of decisions are still going to be worked through. Um, uh, I would reiterate the point that I made uh, last in the previous answer, is that we want to maximise our public media outcomes regardless of where they are realised, whether that be through the new public media entity uh, or whether that be through funding from New Zealand On Air. Uh, we don't want both of those entities um, creating the same kinds of content. Uh, we want to make sure that that's coordinated so we get maximum output, uh, maximum content and maximum audiences um, for a limited amount of money that taxpayers will always um, be able to make sure is directed to um, public broadcasting or public media. So those two entities will have to work uh, in tandem once a new entity comes into being about making sure that they um, are working together and understanding what the entity is doing and also the funding decisions and, and purpose or direction that New Zealand On Air is taking. I believe they can both work uh, in a way to make sure that New Zealand On Air continues to do its work. Uh, and I, I think, um, and I know there are people from uh, the, 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 the private media companies uh, on this call as well, um, who have very heavily um, relied on and are probably thankful for the kinds of funding that New Zealand On Air has provided to ensure that a particular genre can still be available on their on their platforms, and I think that will that will continue. Um, but obviously, we want to make sure there's coordination between New Zealand On Air and the new public media entity. I think we we, we now have quite a proliferation of, uh, of chat questions, uh, and the minister is very sensibly taking some refreshment. Uh, I'm going to throw two, two two questions at him at once, although I think they're fairly straightforward. Uh, one is, will the model be more like uh, national radio or more like TVNZ? And secondly, will the new public media entity remain primarily in Wellington and Auckland in terms of production, or will more attention be paid to the needs of the regions? Um, both of those questions um, are not for me to answer, and um, for the establishment board and, and the new board of the new entity to have um, answers for once they've done uh, uh, you know, the grant work um, over the next six or seven months. Um, I don't think you want me kind of giving direction as to where um, the entity should be based. Um, what I want to make really clear is what I've asked to kind of get from the new media entity is the kinds of content reflects like, all of New Zealand's areas. 
um, geographically, uh, culturally as well. I think that was a lot of the driving force behind the decision around the Public Interest Journalism Fund. We wanted to make sure there was a greater representation and support of uh, journalism in, in New Zealand. And I'd like to see that uh, those values uh, continued in the public media entity. For me, it's um, uh, where it's based, um, while it will be important, um, what it covers uh, and what it delivers to audiences, for me, is more important. Okay. Now, we now have a question about the uh, charter for the new public media entity from Lisa Chatfield. And Lisa is asking, is the charter formally part of the legislation? How much time will be available for public input into the charter? And is that where you think a remit for the public media entity's obligation to the children of New Zealand would sit? I think you may have frozen there, Chris. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I can hear you again now, Peter. Sorry, there was a bit of a drop out there. Yeah, I think I think we're back, we're back online. That's yeah. good. It was just a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. So, sorry, did you did you hear the question? I, th I heard the beginning of it. Um, so, um, I, I think it was very similar to Gavin's question. Um, the the charter conversation will happen as part of the legislation legislative process. Um, we will make sure that there is, uh, um, you know. Uh, an appropriate amount of time uh, to have that discussion. Um, I think um, we've just been through a review of the RNZ chart and saw um, good interest there. Um, so we can imagine that there'll be good interest and sharp interest in the, in, in the draft charter for the new entity. Um, uh, but we all obviously have a legislative time frame to work through to make sure that the legislative basis for the new entity is there well and truly before um, the 31st of July next year. Yeah, the the, the follow-up part was the question of, do, do you think there's a remit for the public media entity's obligation to the children of New Zealand? Would that be specified in the Charter? Absolutely. Um, I have been talking a lot about the future, um, and I've sp spent um, some time talking about um, children and grandchildren. I, I think, um, I, I don't want to judge the, the age demographic of this call, but we have all had the benefit, I think, of quality public um, broadcast in the future. And I think it is adherent on us to ensure that for future generations, they have the benefit of quality public. Oh dear. I think we've frozen again, unfortunately. Hopefully normal service will be resumed in short time. It only took about a couple of seconds last time for them to come back. But the first dropout was not quite uh, is there as well. Minister's back now. Sorry, sorry, Minister, we, we, we lost the last 30 seconds of your, your response. Our, our oh, it was, the best, it was the best answer I've ever given to a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might just, I, I might just um, um, reiterate it then. Um, if I think about the audiences of the future, we've got to make sure that the entity uh, and the values in the charter that serve it um, uh, reflect that. Um, so it really is, as I said, it's future proofing. It's making sure we don't get to a crisis state and um, that we're doing this ahead of um, things getting to a point where it's um, our opportunity to capture those new audiences has passed. Thank you. Um, our own Miles Thomas, who's chair of the Better Public Media Trust, is asking. Will it be a watchdog to ensure that the public media entity maintains its public media values? Um, and in order for time, I'm going to add a question from Mark Madel. Will there be advertising on national radio? I think um, you've already answered that. But so the, answer, so the answer to Mark's question is no. I think we've got another dropout, unfortunately. Um, Sorry, Minister. Technical hitches. Zoom's great until the internet drops out, right? I'm not sure who's in the chat. No to lack of advertising on RNZ. But um, mm. I should say, uh, I think the Minister's also answered the question about will there be provisions to protect funding? Um, he did talk about that a little earlier. So Oh, what a shame. Oh, he's had to drop out completely. Uh, someone, oh, someone's trying to come in on iPhone. Have you got that? Yeah, I've um, let them in. Uh, 
Help, we've lost the minister. <laughs> if seen, please return to. I would have thought the government's um, internet service would be a bit better than that. <laughs> well, that is rather unfortunate. Our, our apologies for the technical hitch. Um, the minister is going to have to leave fairly shortly. Um, I see there's a couple of other questions um, about Manatu Taonga uh, playing an active role in ensuring that the new entity will work together with New Zealand on Air. Um, given that they will be monitoring both organisations and another one from David uh, about the definitions of public media, the extent of making revenue from subscription services where public media is buying international content and charging the public for it. Um, very good questions. Um, I think maybe we're going to have to, to move on. Uh, is there any sign of the minister returning? Peter, I can answer those questions if, when they, if you want to spend them, send them to the panel or when I, you want to do that, I can answer those. For well, it, well it, whilst we're uncertain about the minister's return, I, I, I think it would be marvellous if you could uh, take over. I just briefly introduced the Honourable Tracy Martin. Tracy, of course, was the uh, former New Zealand First MP and was spokesperson for broadcasting, communications and IT, education and women's affairs. Tracy also served as Minister for uh, Children and Minister of Internal Affairs, uh, Minister for Seniors and Associate Minister for Education. And Tracy was chair of the Strong Public Media Governance Group and now the Establishment Board. So uh, the floor is yours, Tracy. Please take over. Kia ora. Sorry, I'll just run through the questions that are up there. And if the minister comes back on, he can jump back on. Um, the first one there that he was halfway through, will there be advertising on national radio? The minister has um, guaranteed that what is currently commercial free will remain commercial free. So I hope that that answers that question because this is a new entity. This is not a merge, nor is it a takeover. This is a new entity. So will there be more advertising on national radio? I'm not currently confident that with that question fills the space of the new entity. All right, but what is commercial free will remain commercial free. Will there be any provisions to protect funding for this new entity, even if there is a change of government? Um, no government can bind the hands of a future government. Um, you can only do your best to make sure that everybody understands that this is a good idea um, and also to bring the public with you so that it's politically not a good idea to muck around with it. So um, I guess that's what we're trying to do is make sure that we do a really, really good job. Uh, to protect it in that way. Um, will Mana, Manato Tonga be playing an active role in ensuring that the public media entity and New Zealand on Earth work effectively in tandem, given that the ministry will officially monitor both organisations? Actually, New Zealand on Air will have a role in monitoring as well. New Zealand on Air, there has to be, as Minister mentioned, uh, visibility across uh, the new entity and what the content is being created and the audience is being served. And that has to go back the other way. So also across New Zealand on Air, so that the New Zealand taxpayer dollar is being used to its best benefit to deliver on the public charter. Um, but also the Minister for the Ministry for Culture and Heritage will have a um, oversight over the entity as it does over, you know, and also continue with New Zealand on air and Treasury will have some oversight, some monitoring oversight over the new entity as well. The last one I see there is from David Cormack, which is, does the definition of public media extend to making revenue from subscription services where public media is buying international content and charging the public for it? At this stage, that hasn't been defined. Um, I think uh, we are still working on what is the funding um, mechanism for this entity. We have, um, obviously, in the budget, we have some baseline funding for the next four years. We also know what funding we're bringing in from a commercial uh, provider at this time, e.g. TVNZ. Um, and so at the moment, the, the BC, um, sorry, the um, establishment board is working as one of its work streams on that uh, funding mechanism. But we are definitely trying to keep all avenues open for the entity when its actual board and a new CE takes its place. Tracy, thank you for that. I was just um, going to draw your attention to my question, oh. which got missed out there, which was, um, will, there, will there be a watchdog 
to ensure that public media entity maintains its um, public media values? So, I mean, the current watchdogs that are in play will still be there. Um, and, and again, um, the Ministry of Culture and Heritage will be um, setting some baselines and will have to measure the entity against its delivery of the charter provisions. Um, so that's what their job is, while Treasury obviously will be watching money. At this stage, that's what we've got, um, although a monitoring, what is the appropriate level of monitoring and who will do it, we will be making recommendations about that um, so that once the entity is there and up and running, maybe we will, it's possible we, we, we will be recommending a change to the monitoring regime to ensure that it delivers on its charter and on the vision, which is a public media entity supported by commercial revenue, not a commercial entity doing a bit of public media. Well, I think that's that's a very fulsome response. Thank you very much indeed, Tracy. Um, we have had a message um, that the minister, unfortunately, is unable to rejoin our session. So our, our sincere thanks to Minister Farfoy. Uh, that's a very, very um, useful contribution to the debate. And obviously the minister is very busy. So we much appreciate the time that he spent uh, contributing this evening.